Hello magpies, and welcome back to the final piece in the puzzle. Constructing the Imperial Provinces for my fan-made variation upon the Forgotten Realms. Today we have a big episode that may well make me regret recording all of my videos in a single take, but nonetheless we have for you an extremely diverse selection of regions, nominally under the protectorate of the Southern Palatinate. But lines on a map do not necessarily delineate distinctions on the ground. And in reality, the South is as divided as it is diverse. From our overhead view, let us swoop a little closer and begin. When the armies of Cormia marched south during the Restoration, King Azun came across the lands of Kalimshan, which are ruled by genies of incredible power, known as the Jinn. He met with King Udistir, eldest of the Pandu clan, and was so impressed with his fellow ruler's wisdom that Azun asked the genie king to protect and to rule over all of the land south of the Western Heartlands and the Dragon Coast. What Azun did not know, however, was that his visit came during a brief pause in a bloody civil war between the Panduva and Karova families that had raged for centuries, intensifying since the gods of the Jinn departed the material plane during the Divine Spell Plague. After the death of Azun, and the reignition of this age-old feud. The Drow took advantage of the conflict to conquer the nations of Tethia and Arm, while the Kalashite lords were distracted. Kalimshan is home to some of the greatest heroes of the world. Genies of power akin to demigods, such as the great warrior Arjuna, whose bow Gandiva may fire an arrow to split a mountain asunder, and the sound of its bowstring plucked may cause entire armies to flee in terror. Magic and the acquisition of powerful boons from the gods of Kalimshan are an everyday part of life in this exotic land. The Kalashite people weave exotic textiles which are sought the world over, and they build crystal palaces that are the envy of kings. They create powerful magic items, and they do battle against devils and fiends for control of the Earth's greatest magical artifacts. The Kalashite society is stratified into a formal caste system, with the Kshatriya warrior kings in charge, guided by Brahmin mystic philosophers, and beneath them, the Vaishyas, landlords, farmers and merchants, and the Sudras, being the peasants and artisans. Inhabitants of Kalimshan speak Alzado, as their native tongue, and those with the means to leave their homeland often come from a lesser known fifth caste, known as the Sutas, being the children of Brahmins and Kshatriyas. And these Sutas, they often become charioteers, which allows them to travel far and wide in service of their demigod lords. Depending on if their service is to a Brahmin or to a warrior lord, suitors may take either a wand of magic missiles or studded leather armor and three potions of healing. The major faiths of Kalimshan include their own unique pantheon, normally led by a trinity of Brahma the Creator, Vishnu the Preserver, and Shiva the Destroyer. And beneath them, a multiplicity of powers gods, demons, and avatars. So many that merely to speak their names would derail this video, extending it far beyond its intended length. The Kalashite people also follow some of the Faerunian deities, such as Azuth, Shareths, Shares, Ilmata, Anaktia, which is their name for Tia, Balros, 
which is their name for Talos, and Ibrandel, which is their name for Shah. I have taken more liberties with reinterpreting Kalimshan than I have other regions, steering it away from its traditional Arabian theme. I have done so in part to preserve the distinctive flavour of the Al Qadim setting on the continent of Zakara, south of Faerun. But my primary motivation was because I desire a canvas upon which to paint the mythical Hindu golden age of the Mahabharat and the Ramayana. Legends that rank among the most important spiritual and mythological texts of India. Presently, Kalimshan's isolation stemming from its civil war limits the potential for this magical land to radically reshape the world as it, well, is past capable of doing. But should Pandora's box be opened, players will find within the most powerful fantasy heroes imaginable. Warriors and gurus wielding the power of the gods, set to the backdrop of the Great War of the Mahabharat. The Lake of Steam refers to the inland sea to the east of Kalimshan, around which greatly varied interests from Kalimshan and abroad hold influence over a hodgepodge of city-states and small countries. Volcanic activity turns the waters of this sea a yellowish hue, and sea life in the region will grow to enormous size. It is a frontier land of great opportunity, and the ongoing war of nearby Kalimshan causes many Kalashite dreamers to move east into the Lake of Steam, seeking a better life. A permanent magical gate set up within the Lake of Steam allows for travel from other parts of the world. And thus the Lake of Steam proves to be a melting pot of cultural mixing and innovation. Civilizational experiments rise and fall, with new people moving in all the time to repurpose abandoned structures. The plentiful, the plentiful resources and exotic sea life inevitably find its way back to Kalimshan, such that these border kingdoms might be better described as Kalimshan's front garden than as their independent neighbours. Regardless, a tourist may find this land their best opportunity to experience Kalashite culture without extensive danger to themselves from the ongoing war to the west. Inhabitants of the Lake of Steam speak both Alzedo and Sharan as their common tongues, and those seeking adventure may take either a scimitar or a glaive, while those of clandestine interests may take either a potion of dark vision or a potion of invisibility. All faiths are to be found in the multicultural lands of the Lake of Steam, except the heretical faiths, which have so far not been observed this far south. As far as historical analogues go, the Lake of Steam is a decentralised, softer, pastoral depiction of India, with perhaps the fertility of the inland sea supporting life throughout the region being an allegory, perhaps, for the life-giving waters of the River Ganges. Likewise, its waters evoke echoes of the Black Sea, and the many influences, cultures, and conflicts around its borders throughout history. The warm, humid lands of the Vilhon Reach are the cradle of humanity, from which successive waves of men and women spread forth to conquer and inhabit Faerun. Today it is a rich, fertile land full of petty nations and quarrelling city-states. Most notably, Chondath, Sespek, and Termish. 
Across much of the Reach, spellcasting is tightly controlled and monitored. No small wonder given its history of wizards and their vulgar displays of power. Not to mention that druids in these lands are prone to violent opposition to human expansion. Some of the cities in the Reach rank among the finest, mathematically perfected examples of efficient architecture found across Faerun. And in some cases, these cities are able to contain hundreds of thousands of inhabitants without overwhelming their infrastructure. Though the Reach pays tribute to Kalimshan as their protector, some of the Vilhon states are wealthy enough to maintain connections and influence in most, if not all, political arenas. Chondath, aptly named as the homeland of the Chondathans, who conquered most of Western Faerun, was once the capital of an empire that ruled over the entire Vilhon Reach, as well as Sembia and the Dragon Coast. Military defeat, plague, tragedy, and the declared independence of their largest city, Hlondath, leaves the city of Chondath as a mere shadow of its former glory. Though they are culturally dominant, across the wider Vilhon Reach area, they are politically declawed. Many across the Reach have not forgotten their mistreatment that suffered by their ancestors under Chondath rule, and this leaves the kingdom with very few allies left, leading them to send their tributes meant for Kalimshan to King, King Vladimir of Impultur instead, seeking to make an ally across the sea to the north. In fact, many of the weapons used in Vladimir's war of colonialism were made in Chondath. Inhabitants of Chondath or other parts of the Reach, all except Sespek and Termish, they speak Chondathan as their common tongue and make, may take either the rapier and a dagger if their priority is killing their enemy, or studded leather armour if their priority is to survive and fight another day. The major faiths of the Vilhon Reach are Eldath, Helm, Lyra, Malar, Nobanyan, Sylvanus, Talos, Tempus, and Tyr. While Chondath worships Helm, Lyra, Malar, Talos, Tempus, and Joaquin. The Vilhon Reach represents a theme of colonial power in decline. And as the cradle of civilization, I am inclined to highlight analogues for the great cities of Persia, who were technologically and culturally light years ahead of their western neighbours. Chondath in particular should represent only a shadow of that former greatness, propped up only by wealth and political leverage weakened by the ravages of the Spell Plague. The tiny nation of Sespek won its independence from Chondath some 500 years ago. But the inhabitants still view themselves as young, scrappy underdogs. Although it is a feudal barony, uh, barons of Sespec are elected by communal gatherings where all may participate regardless of their social status. Military service is mandatory in Sespec, and indeed they need every soldier, for their weapons and tactics are primitive compared to Chondath's uh, massed pike formations, their muskets and their cannons. But despite their inferior technology, guerrilla warfare and exceedingly skilled cavalry are suspects bread and butter. And anyone seeking to conquer their tiny kingdom should expect an extended period of resistance. Inhabitants of Sespec speak Sharon, and they may take either studded leather armor or a warhorse and a saddle 
depending on whether their military service had them fight on foot or on horseback. The major faiths of Sespec are Eldath, Helm, Lyra, Malar, Talon, Tempus, and Joaquin. For historical analogues, Sespec is part Wakanda and part the Gauls from the Asterix series. Sespec represents a small, proud kingdom who have managed to resist colonialism through their ingenuity and strength working in unison. The unspoiled wilderness of Termish is home to the Tarami people. Cities are rare in Termish, with most people preferring to live close to nature as they have for thousands of years. Meanwhile, the maze-like and harsh terrain make invading this fertile land almost impossible. Termish attracts adventurers aplenty by its breathtaking scenery and many secrets to explore, such that Termish has no need for a military with mercenary bands of adventurers keeping the road safe. Hospitality and freedom are valued among all else, above all else among the Tarami people. When most people think of the Tarami, however, they imagine highly skilled mercenaries with gunpowder weapons and advanced military tactics, whose families follow them from conflict to conflict, for they have no home to return to. This is a half-truth, for that uh, stereotype refers to one tribe of the Tarami, who are known as the Shaka. During the Spell Plague, the Shaka took advantage of the chaos to conquer and enslave their neighbouring tribes, forcing them to produce goods which the Shaka sold to Chondath in exchange for advanced weaponry, which they then used to overthrow the peaceful and democratic land of Termish and begin their own reign of tyranny. However, after a popular uprising and a long, brutal civil war. The Shaka were exiled from Termish in their thousands. Into the waiting arms of King Vladimir of Impultur, who paid them handsomely to become his personal army, fueling his conquest of the Northern Palatinate. Inhabitants of Termish speak Termic, as their common tongue and may take either a spear for those who seek the thrill of hunting game or two potions of healing for those who prefer a more peaceful existence. The major faiths in Termish are Chontia, Eldath, Helm, Lyra, Leviathar, Nobanyan, Sylvanus, Selune, Tempus and Tyr. I was not being subtle when I named the exiled Tarami Shaka. Termish is an analogue for the various peoples who inhabited Southeast Africa during the time of the Zulu Empire. In an ideal world where they not only rose up against European settlers, but also threw off the tyranny of Shaka Zulu himself. The exiled Tarami are a nightmare vision of if the Zulu warriors themselves were as well armed and equipped as their colonizers. And uh, the whole Shaka mercenary army is kind of inspired by Italian mercenaries in the Mediterranean sphere. Chondlewood is not so much a nation as it is a large natural obstacle that separates the, north, the southern and eastern Palatinate. And indeed, it is an obstacle that very few would dare to cross. It is one of the large, one of the greatest large untamed forests of the world. Unspoiled by loggers and uncultivated by woodsmen. Furthermore, the Chondlewood grows larger every year. It is protected by fierce tribes of ghost-wise halflings and militant druids who oppose any human influence 
upon the woods, as well as various fey and other creatures. If anywhere in the world still has true elves, surely they reside somewhere deep within the Chondlewood. The few hardy individuals who inhabit the Chondlewood speak Sharon as their common tongue and may take either a short bow and arrows, a long bow and arrows, or a spear for self-defense. Others may take three doses of blue winning potion, poison rather, a poison applied by injury requiring a constitution save DC 10 or else the subject will fall unconscious for 6d10 minutes. This uh, blue winning potion poison being a substance used by the druids and the ghostwise halflings to induce wild visions. While others coat their weapons with an abundant poison found in the woods and may take two doses of giant spider poison. A poison applied by injury that deals 2d6 poison damage or half on a constitution save DC 11. The major faiths of Chondlewood are Helm, Lyra, Malar, Talus, Tempus and Joaquin. Chondlewood fills an important narrative role in any fantasy world, being the untamed wild woods, the elemental force of the forests, inside of which is that land that time forgot. Until recently, Tethia was a growing nation, with a bright future ahead of it. Until one day, the sun went into eclipse, and from the small teeth mountains bordering Arm, an endless tide of creatures from the Underdark spewed forth, directed by a ruthless elite army of Dro, which together began to rush across the countryside, slaughtering all in their path. The ever-adaptive Tetherians retreated to the forests that covered the interior of their homeland, and to this day they are pushed ever further backwards and deeper into an archipelago with their backs to the sea. The sky turned dark over Tethia, and eternal night reigned, blocking out healing magic and preventing magical communication with the outside world. So. Mayhap either the understandably preoccupied Kalimshan being a nation at war with itself, either they don't know about the severity, the severity of their neighbor's situation, or maybe they don't care. And frankly, I don't know which is worse. Regardless, the people of Tethia cry out for aid. Inhabitants of Tethia speak Chondathan as their common tongue, and based on their profession they have access to some magical goods. Um, those who lack magic may take a potion of greater healing, while arcane casters may take a scroll of blur and a scroll of resistance from energy, while finally divine casters may take a scroll of aid and a scroll of lesser restoration. The major faiths of Tethia are Selvatam and Veron, among the occupying drow. Among the, among the human civilizations holding out, they maintain their native religions of Helm, Ilmata, Siamorph, Torm, and Tyr. As far as historical analogues go, Tathia originally wasn't that different from other western frontier nations, but now as their deterioration, deteriorating situation stands as a rallying cry for the Raven's Banner to come to their aid, there are echoes of Constantinople resisting the Seljuk Turks leading up to the First Crusade. 
Arm was once a tremendously wealthy country where arcane magic was largely illegal. Until the Drow came, massacring entire cities and choking the rivers with the dead. Those left alive were enslaved or kept as feed for the demons and devils that now roam the benighted landscape of what was once Arm. The Drow now use Arm as a staging ground to push their armies of underdark creatures north into the western heartlands as their blanket of night creeps further towards Baldur's Gate. Former inhabitants of Arm speak Chondathan as their common tongue and they may take thieves tools and a hand crossbow and bolts if they were trained as spies or scoundrels for the once thriving mercantile empire. Alternatively, everyday folk trained with the sword so they may take either a long sword or a short sword. And finally, the elite, those wealthy knights, nobles and merchants. They rode exquisite steeds and thus they may take a warhorse with saddle and studded leather barding. The major faiths of Arm were Bane, Chontia, Siric, Salune, Sune, and Wakun. Now, only the religions of their conquerors remain. Before its fall, Arm stood as an analogue for the most authoritarian and colonial excesses of Spanish history, right up to their colonies in Mazdaca. Now, their own cruelty against the Mazdakan natives and their oppression of their own people is at least temporarily forgotten, outmatched by the greater cruelty of their elven invaders. The mighty jungle peninsula of Chult. It belongs to no nation, but is recognised as part of the Southern Palatinate only because of a handful of settlements representing Kalashite interests on the coastline. Their interior, however, is chock full of jungle dwarves, dinosaurs, tribespeople and many dangers, including a giant volcano the locals worship as the god Abtao. Those who can survive the sweltering heat of this place will find it full of strange flora and fauna, as well as many riches and wonders. But do not be mistaken into thinking that this land can be tamed. Inhabitants of Chult speak Chultan as their native tongue. Scouts and explorers of the jungle may take a, do a potion of pass without trace, or those who cultivate and hunt the strange wildlife may take two doses of giant scorpion poison, a poison delivered by injury which deals 46, 40, 10 poison damage, or half as much on a DC 12 constitution saving throw. Well, finally, those who adopt the weapons of the native tribespeople may take either a kukri, which is a curved dagger good for cutting through jungle vines, or they may take a spear. The major faiths of Chult are Ubtau, Thadha, and an aspect of Shah, known as a Shaodao. Schult is more a literary than an historical analogue, being a mythical depiction of every volcano-worshipping Pacific Islander culture and a treasure, hunter's, a treasure hunter's imagination of the Amazon rainforest. All of these, all of these themes rolled into one, with plenty of dinosaurs thrown in for good measure. Thank you, magpies. And by now, North, South, East, West, and the Central Palatinate. All of the domains of the Cormerian Empire are now outlined in, their ba outlined in their base forms, culminating in the fractured and diverse realms of the South. 
distracted and in the process of being devoured by drow ambition, thus forming a focal point for the story so far. But if you think I am done, you are mistaken. For the devil is in the details, and many smaller imps emerge between the pages of grand narratives in the form of independent, unaligned nations existing across the length and breadth of Faerun, which we shall be covering next time on the expanded homelands of heterodoxy.